Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario, and online experiences to anyone in this mortal realm. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director, and it is my privilege to be your haunted host for this episode. Tales of madness, stories of mystery, and moral lessons filled with abject horror. The words of the great American writer Edgar Allan Poe still resonate today, nearly two centuries later. Poe's stories remain relevant and timeless, with adaptations and continual interpretations of his dark mind, most recently with Netflix's Fall of the House of Usher, proving that his legacy has endured long beyond his short life. He has left an indelible mark on the literary horror and mystery genres, shaping our understanding of the modern world. His observations, reflections, themes, and dreary interpretations continue to hold our interest. Perhaps this is why Poe remains one of the most famous authors of his generation, offering a diverse range of works for any reader. While his literary works extend beyond horror, he will be likely most remembered for those shocking tales that prompt even the most seasoned readers to gasp in fright. Undoubtedly, one of the most iconic horror writers of all time, Edgar Allan Poe possessed a vivid imagination. Poe's creativity and uncanny talent for weaving fantastical stories continue to inspire creatives of all kinds today. However, was it all a product of his imagination? It's easy to assume that Poe's tumultuous life, marked by a childhood filled with tragedy and a young adulthood peppered with losses, was sufficient inspiration for his horrific tales. Yet, was there more? Examining real-life stories from his time, reveals that Poe discovered these unthinkable horrors in the world around him. Many of his tales of murder, torture, mayhem, and depravity were based or inspired by actual events. In this episode, we'll delve into the inspirations for Edgar Allan Poe and explore some of the real-world events that inspired four of his iconic stories. From rivalries taken too far, to newspaper reports, court proceedings, and epidemics, Poe found insights in the world around him. Let's delve into Poe's creative genius and explore what may have inspired him to write some of the most warped stories of all time. But before we get to that, I do have a couple of updates to share. On Saturday, December 16th, for one night only, we will be partnering with the Fox Theatre in Toronto and the Bytown Cinema in Ottawa for an evening of haunted holiday stories. Join us as we revive the Victorian tradition of sharing ghost stories to celebrate the holiday season. Storytellers from the Haunted Walk will spread spooky cheer with spellbinding tales of the otherworldly and supernatural with a holiday spin. We'll also screen a classic short film to add to your eerie experience. In addition, there will be a VIP experience for 16 brave souls who will stay after the theater closes for a paranormal investigation with our team. The 60-minute adventure is a great introduction to investigating the paranormal while exploring modern and ancient methods used to commune with the other side. Tickets for our evening of haunted holiday stories can be found on our website, hauntedwalk 
www.ghostdoctor.com. There you can also find information on our ghost tours and paranormal adventures happening in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto into December. Last week, we also launched our Haunted Holiday Cards. These unique cards embrace the spooky, eerie, and downright disturbing side of the holiday season. We have giant gingerbread, creepy canes, frightening frosties, and all sorts of other spooky designs. Some are already sold out, so make sure to get yours soon. Have fun sending the most memorable cards of the season. You can follow the link in the show notes or visit our online gift shop on our website to see them all. We ship to both Canada and the US. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Haunted Walk. And be sure to follow, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. And the revel went whirling on, until at length was sounded the twelfth hour upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolution of the waltzers were quieted. And there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened, perhaps that more of a thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus again it happened, perhaps that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur, expressive at first of surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. For literary critics, one of Poe's most famous examples of short story mastery is The Mask of the Red Death, published in 1842. Frequently cited as a pinnacle of his Gothic achievements, the story is a dark tale with a clear moral message for its readers. If you're unfamiliar with the story, the text is about Prince Prospero, a fictional Italian ruler who holds up in his abbey to avoid the terrible suffering and sickness that is plaguing the citizens of his lands, known as the Red Death. He is joined by several other nobles, and they hold a grand party, complete with costumes, drinking, and debauchery. However, amid their festivities, a strange figure enters the scene, a mysterious person dressed as Red Death, with a corpse-like face and blood-splattered robes. The figure solemnly marches through the party as the clock strikes midnight, closely followed by the prince, who tries to ward off death with a dagger, but to no avail. The prince falls down, dead, and the other revelers are taken out swiftly by the Red Death one by one, until no one remains. For many, the story is a judgment against the prince and other nobles who ran away from their responsibilities and laughed in the face of so much suffering. It's a reminder that life is short and we all face the same fate, death. At the end of the day, no matter how many riches we may amass in life, 
and how long we try to cheat its firm grasp. However, the moral tale took on different layers of meaning for readers over time. Perhaps after we have emerged from a global pandemic ourselves, there are 21st century meanings you might derive from this timeless tale. But where did Poe get his inspiration? Let's look back at the context of his life. Many diseases were circumnavigating the globe in the early 19th century, and the symptoms described in the story could apply to nearly any ailment. But it probably most resembles tuberculosis. The disease, often called consumption at the time, was sweeping urban areas, leaving people permanently disabled and many suffering for countless years before death. It commonly struck the lungs, and those diagnosed with consumption painfully coughed up blood as their other organs very slowly failed. Although the disease was rampant and mainly struck down the poor, it wasn't a plague per se, and Poe's red death seemed to be something swifter. Others have considered that Poe was probably inspired by accounts of the Black Death, or the bubonic plague that swept through Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. The costume of the Red Death even somewhat resembles the plague doctors of the Middle Ages. But perhaps there's an epidemic even closer to home. Cholera had reached plague proportions at the start of the 19th century, particularly as people moved towards crowded industrial centers and no longer had access to clean drinking water. Edgar Allan Poe lived in Baltimore during the great cholera epidemic of 1831. The city, overcrowded, generally poor, suffered terribly and was one of the hardest hit American population centers with the disease forever imprinting on the Harbor City. Poe was surrounded by death on a daily basis, and he would have opened his newspaper to countless accounts of suffering. But back in 1832, he also probably opened his paper to a bit of a different story. The New York Mirror, a weekly periodical very popular with the literary community, published a story about a masquerade ball that took place in Paris in the middle of a cholera epidemic. The writer was intrigued, but seemingly horrified that people were poking fun at the notion of death, encouraging others to participate in plague dances, and even featuring a man dressed up as cholera. In this real-life story, the revelers, presumably, don't all die from cholera at the end. But there was an underscore of a moral lesson for readers and a deep, abject horror at daring to dance with death. Although the story was published in the mirror ten years before Poe wrote The Mask of the Red Death, it's well known that Poe saved favorite newspaper clippings and other inspirations for use in his stories to come. Perhaps the impetus for finally writing his narrative was the sickness of his wife, Virginia. In early 1842, she began suffering terribly from consumption, and Poe began his steady descent into alcoholism. We had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments, some provisions, and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. What must have been the astonishment of all then, when having proceeded a few fathoms from the ship, Mr. Wyatt stood up in the stern sheets and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should be put back for the purpose of taking in 
his oblong box. Sit down, Mr. Wyatt, replied the captain, somewhat sternly. You will capsize us if you do not sit quite still. Our gunwale is almost in the water now. The box, vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. The box, I say, Captain Hardy, you cannot, you will not refuse me. Its weight will be but a trifle. It is nothing, mere nothing. By the mother who bore you, for the love of heaven, by your hope of salvation, I implore you to put back for that box. The captain, for a moment, seemed touched by the earnest appeal of the artist, but he regained his stern composure and merely said, Mr. Wyatt, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay, hold him, seize him. He is about to spring overboard. A lesser-known story in the Pau-Ouvre is the Oblong Box, a tale of mystery, love, and death, some of Poe's favorite themes. By the time he published this story in 1844, Poe was becoming known not only for his Gothic themes, but also his fascination with detective stories. Heralded as one of the first writers to popularize the murder mystery in modern Western culture, Poe loved taking the reader through a curious situation, posing questions along the way, and then finally revealing the solution at the end of the story. The oblong box, although not strictly a detective tale, definitely followed the spirit of a simple but moralistic mystery. The story tells of a sea voyage and centers on a man named Wyatt, his wife, and his two sisters, who are all traveling together in three staterooms. Curiously, Wyatt's wife seems to leave him every evening and spend her night alone in a different room. Wyatt slumbers alone in the main stateroom accompanied only by a large and strangely shaped box that seems to have a peculiar odor emanating from it. Wyatt can be heard every night wailing, presumably near his precious cargo, which the narrator of the story mistakes for a bout of artistic inspiration. Suddenly, the ship is caught in a storm, and while all the other passengers and crew safely abandon the ship before it sinks, Wyatt chains himself to the mysterious box and refuses to leave, dutifully going down with the ship. The narrator later learns from the captain that the ship was carrying the body of Wyatt's recently deceased wife. The woman he was seen with was a maid, simply posing as his wife to avoid any suspicion. The oblong box was, in fact, a coffin containing a corpse. Regular readers of Poe will know that he relished a tragic love story, an early life surrounded by the death of loved ones, including his wife, likely inspired him to write so many tales of woe. While there is no direct connection between this story and his own personal tragedies, Poe probably couldn't resist penning a sad story of romance as his career and fame were blooming. Also, right before writing The Oblong Box, Poe himself had embarked on a steamship voyage during a move to New York City. This type of travel was new and innovative for his time, so this setting of a steamship was quite modern. 
While we might be more used to the idea of transporting coffins over long distances to return the deceased to important places or burial grounds, the practice wasn't very widespread in the early 19th century, mainly because transportation was slow and the preservation of a corpse is complicated. The idea of sharing a room with a dead body, in a coffin or not, would have been even more shocking in 1844. But as with many of Poe's stories, it wasn't unheard of. A very famous murder occurred in 1841, and the perpetrator was found out because they tried to ship a body to conceal a crime. John C. Colt murdered Samuel Adams, not the famous brewer, over an unpaid bill. In an attempt to cover the crime, Colt placed the corpse in a large box, surrounded by salt, in an attempt to preserve the body, and placed it on a ship bound for New Orleans. The growing stench was initially ignored by the crew, who were probably used to all sorts of weird smells emanating from the cargo hold. But, unlucky for Colt, the ship was delayed by a storm, and police were able to use skilled detective work to quickly track the shipment before it even left the port. The sensational case flooded newspapers for months. People around the world were soaking up the strange story, eager to read every new twist and turn. After being found guilty of murder and sentenced to death, Colt was married, then almost immediately committed suicide. The whole event sounds straight from an Edgar Allan Poe story, and he probably could have used it to inspire a work of fiction on its own. However, it was so well known by readers of his time that it would have been recognized instantly. Instead, Poe took a small element of the famous tale and skillfully wove it in with his other favorite subjects, love and death. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all, and it continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than the derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt I must scream or die. And now, again, hark louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Let's turn to one of Poe's most famous stories, and one of the reasons for his enduring legacy as a horror writer. The Tell-Tale Heart. Many of us are probably familiar with this one. I remember seeing it, on one of the Simpsons' Treehouse of Horror episodes. But let's recap. The story is told by an unnamed narrator who recounts a strange tale. Throughout the narrative, he urges the reader to consider him of sound mind, 
and fully sane. But as the story is shared, the more the reader is unconvinced. The narrator claims that everything started when he began stalking an old man. He would sneak into his bedroom in the dead of night and watch him while he slept. Just as dawn was breaking, he would slip out unnoticed and go on as if nothing had happened. After a week, without provocation, he suddenly had the compulsion to murder the old man. But the plan didn't go smoothly. The old man was awoken, and the narrator felt a moment of pity as he cried out in fear. A dull pounding ensues, which the narrator assumes must be the old man's heart, prompting him to finally murder the old man out of fear of being caught. He then quickly dismembers the body and puts it under the floorboards. But before he can escape into the night, the police show up. Convinced that he's got away with it, the narrator leads the police through the house as if nothing is the matter. But then the narrator hears it. The dull pounding once again. Certain that everyone can hear it too, the narrator descends into madness, confesses to the crime, and makes the policemen rip up the floorboards to discover the remains. Telltale Heart is considered one of Poe's masterpieces for a reason, bringing together all his favorite themes in a story of intrigue. There's death, of course, but also madness and mystery. The reader is led by the narrator, who seems perfectly sane at one moment until they descend into some strange rambling that pulls the reader down with them. As you read the short story, you feel thrown back and forth by the narrator, constantly questioning their sanity, but also your own. A second reading doesn't really help and tends to only heighten the experience, which for us makes its storytelling at its finest. Many have wondered if the narrator was loosely based on Poe himself. By the time the story was published, In 1843, Poe was known as an alcoholic and rumored to be suffering from different illnesses, physical and mental. His own descent into madness has been considered by plenty of literary critics, many of whom point to Telltale Heart as one of his first signals of distress. But others have maintained that Poe was simply inspired by some strange stories that he read elsewhere, eventually weaving them into his own tale of mystery. One possible explanation is the murder of Joseph White back in 1830. The trial was recounted in a pamphlet that was widely distributed. One quote in particular seems to match Poe's story quite aptly. As the special prosecutor says, the secret which the murderer possesses, soon comes to possess him. It overcomes him. It feels its beating at his heart, rising in his throat and demanding discourse. He thinks the whole world sees it in his face, reads it in his eyes, and almost hears its workings in the very silence of his thoughts. It has become his master. It's unclear if Poe ever read the pamphlet or not, but we know for certain that Poe was familiar with the 1840 murder trial of James Wood. This trial was recounted by a reporter for the Alexander's Weekly Messenger, and that reporter happened to be Edgar Allan Poe. In that publication, It was noted that the accused was very cool and collected and confused many people who assumed a madman would be frenzied or crazy 
Poe said that Wood's calmness was the cunning of the maniac, a cunning which baffles that of the wisest man of sound mind and preserves the appearance of perfect sanity. It was clear Poe was rather fascinated with Wood's calmness. While it's very likely that Poe was inspired by the demeanor of people accused of heinous acts, and he wove that idea into his famous tale, there doesn't seem to be a specific inspiration for dismembering a body and putting it under the floorboards, only to have the heartbeat so loud it drives the murderer to madness. Sure, there were stories of people being buried in walls and cellars that Poe would have read in the popular press, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But that image of a still-beating heart under the floor, one of the most iconic and enduring images from Poe's work, appears to be straight out of his imagination. I had scarcely laid the first tier of my masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from deep in the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long, obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to hear it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth the sixth, the seventh layer. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. For our final story, let's turn to The Cask of Amontillado, published in late 1846. For many, this is considered one of Poe's final works of short story horror mastery before his premature death. To recap this one, similar to Telltale Heart, the tale is recounted by a narrator who ends up being a murderer. However, in this story, we don't learn much about the motivations or reasons for the crime. Simply that the nobleman, Montresor, had a massive and murderous grudge against a man named Fortunato. One night, during the height of carnival season in Italy, Montresor manages to convince a very drunk Fortunato to come down to the cellar and catacombs to authenticate a fancy bottle of Amontillado wine. Montresor manipulates his visitor and starts to reveal his cunning plan, but he also plies Fortunato with more wine, and the victim is blissfully unaware of the fate that awaits him. The two eventually arrive at a secluded spot in the catacombs where Montresor chains his captive to the wall. Despite Fortunato's cries for help, Montresor simply mocks him and starts to build a brick wall to entomb him alive. As Fortunato grows more desperate, Montresor simply continues with a coolness until his work is complete. The story chillingly concludes that the body was still undisturbed 50 years later. (laughs) 
what a story of revenge. Surely Poe didn't come up with all that on his own, did he? Well, in fact, he didn't. At least, not entirely. The act of entombing a body in a brick wall was, frighteningly, a relatively common theme in macabre stories of the time. Take an 1844 story from Italy, where some workmen discover a skeleton in the wall of the Church of St. Lorenzo, or a tale probably learned while stationed in Massachusetts in the 1820s, where a man was supposedly chained to a wall before it was permanently sealed off. That tale ended up being fiction, but it's likely Poe knew of the nightmarish narrative. What many have cited as a major inspiration was Joel Headley's A Man Built in a Wall, a recounting of a story of revenge where a man was encased in a brick wall and despite his cries for help, was shown no mercy. Even the general fear of being buried alive was quite real and featured prominently in many of Poe's stories, as it was a concern in the 1840s, especially as new sicknesses swept the world and people were being buried as quickly as possible after death. Sometimes too quickly. But there's something else going on in the cast of Amontillado, something more personal. By the time the story was published, in late 1846, it was public knowledge that Poe had a very long-standing dispute with a fellow writer, Thomas Dunn English. The two had actually started out as friends, but their feud began when Poe apparently made some advances towards a woman who was a mutual acquaintance. English and Poe fought it out, both verbally and physically, and their brawl eventually moved to the public sphere. It seems that Poe technically started it by writing about English and likening his appearance to that of a baboon. English wasn't going to let it go, though, so he ridiculed Poe as a drunken madman in two of his novels, making very clear reference to Poe's most famous works, such as The Raven. Poe got his revenge in court, successfully suing one of the publications for libel. But the feud wasn't over yet, and English and Poe allegedly had another physical altercation shortly after the settlement. Only a few months after all this, Poe comes out with one of his greatest revenge tales yet the cast of Amontillado. Coincidence? Doesn't seem so. The cast of Amontillado contained numerous references to English, but learning from his former friend's downfall, Poe was very careful to simply allude to them rather than name English outright. Poe took plenty of inspiration from English's original revenge novel, using gestures, symbols, and tokens in the cask of Amontillado. The whole setting from the short story, the darkened catacombs filled with wine, is a direct reference to English's novels. For seasoned readers of both men, the relationship between the literary tales would have been crystal clear. But it wasn't enough for English to sue Poe for libel. He was smart at covering his tracks. Some could say that English got his revenge years later, when he published anti-Poe articles long after Poe's death. But the question is, who have you heard of? Thomas Dunn English or Edgar Allan Poe? The cask of Amatiato ends with In Pace Requiescat, Latin for May he rest in peace. A truly iconic ending to a famous story. It seems that Poe, ultimately, may have had the last word in this feud. (laughs) 
In the context of Poe's life, perhaps hindsight is 2020. While he was alive, Edgar Allan Poe was seen as a bit of an eccentric man. He had some quirks, strange habits, seemed to keep odd company, including black cats and birds, and write about strange things. But he was quite respected, a gentleman even, who ran in some of the most elite circles of his time. Perhaps some viewed him as a troubled artist, the type that seems a little different from the norm, but he wasn't simply the outcast in the crowd. At least, not right away. Over time, Poe did seem to descend into madness, or whatever we might call it, and became a recluse. Especially after facing so much tragedy in his life, Poe turned to alcohol and other depressants to calm his restless mind. Some have speculated that he was likely troubled by other mental illnesses or perhaps long-lasting symptoms from a physical ailment that affected his mind or even long-term poisoning from the goods common at that time, such as lead or arsenic. Whatever his troubles in life were, Poe's death was premature and in itself shrouded in mystery. What exactly befell Poe only months after his 40th birthday is unknown. Substance abuse, suicide, madness, some mysterious ailment, it's all speculation. But for many, it was a fitting end for a man who wrote such disturbing stories. Surely, there was something disturbing going on in his mind. But as we've learned from this episode, as troubled as Poe's mind might have been, there were plenty of real-world inspirations for his stories. It took skill and an incredible imagination to weave his horrific tales and invent almost entirely new genres of writing. But inspiration was everywhere he looked. The truth of these stories makes them all the more horrific. The fact that Poe was inspired by real-world events should give us pause when we dismiss his words as simply fiction. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. For information on our evening of haunted holiday stories at two historic theaters in Toronto and Ottawa, as well as our ghost tours and our haunted holiday cards, please check out the links in the show notes or visit our website, hauntedwalk.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter all at Haunted Walk for the latest news and updates. And please follow, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. As always, a special thanks to our hardworking Haunted Talks team, including Brittany Boss, who researched and wrote this episode, and Michelle Dennis, our outstanding audio editor. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. Thank you.